Welcome to another episode of Through the Glass. Uh, I want to thank our host, Lake House Recording Studios, for really allowing me to do this show. And before we get started today, I do want to give a special shout out um, to one of my closest friends. I love him like a brother, Mark Bennett, a.k.a. Mekunda Kishore Das. Am I saying that right? I don't know. I'm sorry if I didn't. This is a guy who's, you know, you have a lot of close friends in your life, but um, you know they're extra close when they're able to keep tabs on you at a distance and they're able to give you constructive feedback when you're trying to do something new. And this podcast for me is and was something new. And he's been a um, just a stalwart of, of feedback and constructive criticism in a way that's been on point. I love you, man. And I want to give a shout out. He's out in California in uh, Poway area. So I want to give a shout out to his businesses, Pappy's Barbershop in College area and Pappy's Barbershop 2 in Poway. And he also uh, runs San Diego Laser Removal. So for all you people who have that unfortunate tattoo, um, maybe it's a phallic symbol, maybe it's a gang sign. And now you're like, hmm, not so good. Um, interesting tidbit, Mark used to also own a few tattoo parlors so he's one of those interesting guys he's going to put it on you and then later on when you're severely regretting your decisions he's going to help you out again super smart business guy mark i love you i uh, can't wait to see you and uh make sure you come on the show when you come in love you brother okay enough about that guy um today on the show really pleased to have an excellent artist, a great artist, uh, and has become a friend. Uh, this is Brother Andrew. Hey, man. Hello. That's a really interesting business model. You put the tattoos on, and you take them off. That's that. You, that guy's got the, all the bases covered. Mark was a genius, or he probably he is he is still a genius. Um, when we were younger, and we we met through music, um, I started playing shows in town probably when I was about 15 so unless my mom was dropping me off at the show which was it wasn't embarrassing it was more just like it was scary for her so I'm 44 years old so when I was 15 getting dropped off at the fast lane um, was yeah. was not a savory situation for a mother to be like okay now go to that world and um, so Mark, who's much, much, much older than me, he's, he's really getting up there in years and hang in there, buddy. Um, he, uh, yeah, he had a license, so he, he, he's you know, forty-five. He, he's, <laughs> <laughs> he, he might, he might be something around there. Um, you know, he was always willing to pick me up and drive me to shows, drive me to rehearsal. He was just my guy. He was like the linchpin to my entrance into performing and being in a band. And then when we started playing and writing, you know, he's the first guy who's like, well, we should have some merchandise. And it's like, yeah, of course, because you could sell that and make money to print your demos. And then when we, and then he's like, well, you know, we're doing well. We should probably start sending out some press kits to record labels. I'm like, yes, there's no reason we shouldn't be signed. And then, <laughs> and then we got signed and then we were touring. And then He's like, we should have some endorsements. Yes. You're like, that's a good idea. Yes, sir. Yeah. The first guy who injects some business sense into the band. You know, it's, it's, I, I suffer from the same plight sometimes. Like, you get so wrapped up in just playing music and enjoying it, you forget that, you know, oh man, this, this show really didn't pay for itself at all. You're like, we, maybe, maybe we should fix that. <laughs> I think it's like the classic folly of most artists um, not having. I mean, kind of a blunt way to put it, but not having a business sense. And why no. should you not be compensated, rewarded? Um, I mean, the people who make the most money sometimes are doing the least creative thing. So, well, I think in a perfect world, um, like really in a perfect world, this is like utopia, like art and business and commerce, like really don't touch each other at all. Because as soon as like something you're making something for any reason, of like any money associated with it. Like it's already not really art anymore. You know what I mean? Maybe expressing why you need money, I could see that. But I don't know. I don't know if like if you're making something just for the sheer purpose of selling it, that essentially is not art in its most purest form. That being said, it's kind of impossible to like have longevity as an artist unless you're getting paid for it in some way, shape, or form. So that's like I honestly think I think that struggle is much much more complicated than people give it credit for 
from I've always thought it was because you have to all like my brother and I talk about this all the time, but there's my brother's also a musician. Um, but we've always talked about how, you know, it's almost like the benefactor, uh, the benefactors from like the, you know, the 17th century that were like funding these like classical musicians make a lot more sense than, you know, someone like uh, Lenny Kravitz, who literally is just a very savvy businessman, but also an incredible artist act probably the other way around an incredible artist but um you know you've you, like i've just heard stories he is also on top of his stuff so it's just really interesting it's hard to get both and when you do that's a great recipe well it's tough i mean if, if you're going to refer to uh you know the renaissance period or, or, or post that when yeah there were benefactors i mean leonardo da vinci um most of his career was funded from um you know, these princely rulers in, in the regions of Italy and other places as well. And um, I think the tricky thing with that is ultimately, I'm not sure how much freedom those artists have. So if you have someone 100% funding you, now he's an outlier because he was such a, I think just the most punk rock artist of all time. He's my favorite human being yeah. of all time. So I, I want to share that. If That's I a cool. Favorite human. That's your favorite human. Of all time. Outside of anyone uh, with the Scotto last name. Um, <laughs> yes, I mean, I don't know if you've read any of his biographies or, or really studied any of his work, but really his painting is really just one part of his, his career. I mean, one of the few guys out there, certainly at the time, who was, yes, creating art, but painting, sculpting, inventing, um, creating instruments, inventing instruments. He was working for the local, um, whatever, I guess the local playhouse would be considered. He was making stage design, making ways for actors to literally kind of fly in. So you would go see a play partially just because he was the one who did the set design because you knew it was going to be so badass and you were going to see shit that probably looked like magic yeah. to people in the 1400s. <laughs> like, how did that happen? It takes a high degree of intelligence to be creative because I think essentially at the end of the day like being creative is just finding two things that weren't connected and connecting them right mm. it's generally not spontaneous creativity is like sometimes people like I, i've i i in, with music specifically i think sometimes think people think that you're going to walk into a studio session and if if you have absolutely no plan and the the the, the, the it's wide open and you're free and you have all the time in the world you're going to get something done and it's never the case like ever like if generally speaking if i've ever gone into a writing session i generally have a couple things like ready to go like queued up at least to just get the spark going and in the same way i think you know really essentially like creativity it's like it's not this magical thing it's really kind of it's engineering uh ideas so you know, that makes a lot of sense when you take like two unlike ideas in a painting and you combine them and then you see contrast, whether that's color or maybe a subject versus like the medium. But it can it probably exactly the same way. And he probably just didn't limit it to himself to one thing, which is like, well, OK, I can use this creativity to combine a string pulley to this light system. And now these now these actors have a different you know mechanism to work with. Um, it's really cool. Like I, I, I think about this stuff like all the time, just as far as like conceptually, like what is being creative and like what is, um, you know, what is art really? Because people ask that all the time, and there's no real good answer for it. But um, yeah, I think I think it's and it's interesting too because I, I I got a Yankees hat on, but it's it's a MoMA hat. It's just like it's I was uh it's the it's I was at the MoMA a couple of weeks ago. And yeah, the ones that, I mean, the, I guess the painters that I was gravitating towards, I just, I've always loved Van Gogh and he seemed to follow me around. Like I've like, was in Amsterdam and like this, the, the sunflower painting was there and I was like, well, that's really cool. And then I go to the MoMA and it's like back at the MoMA and I'm like, that's really cool. It's like, now it's here and it was there. Um, but just another guy, like, you know, as much as people want to be artists and have a career in it, they look at someone like Van Gogh and like, well, that guy had it all figured out his paintings are incredibly famous but you know everyone's kind of familiar with the fact that he didn't sell a single painting his pretty much his whole career and we're just we just love the, his stuff now 
he probably would he probably is rolling over in his grave going like well it would have been great to be like a picasso and actually be kind of famous and have like a beautiful you know well, that's, that's <laughs> a beautiful that, life yeah i mean that's that's like connecting uh being creative and also connecting it with suffering i like how you you made a really good point saying art is often uh, finding two unlike things and connecting them and and, and back to back to the example of da Vinci when people look at his paintings there's some things that he's head and shoulders above all other painters of that time one of them is being able to paint and express movement in hair muscle structure too um, in hair and he just like you pointed out he began that study by sitting and and uh, drawing eddies in rivers so the water comes down and is there a way to predict which way it's going to swirl and what happens with a small swirl and then it goes to a big swirl these little eddies yeah and his study of eddies led to his um his mastery of particularly curly hair sure so you see his drawings of his little muse i forget the guy's name he was never short on uh having uh fellas probably sit around uh for him yeah uh and also even just his um his ability to master the structure of the human body by sort of convincing people to give him some cadavers that he could cut up himself and really look at well when you turn how many uh, how many pieces of muscle are actually in play here and by mastering that suddenly movement becomes so free and, and even some of the other masters at the time like Michelangelo you could see a huge difference once you start really looking at these things like muscle structure and hair. Yep. And apparently they didn't like each other very much. <laughs> um, and also the fact, I mean, this, this had to have been rough um, in a time when you were, you were, I think, just pretty much arrested for being gay or being accused of performing a gay act. He was pretty openly gay and yeah. flamboyant, as, as maybe I would call it, in his dress. Yeah, okay, yeah. Just a badass. Yeah. <laughs> you know, super tall, handsome, it was like it just everything going on. Yeah. I'm sure he had a I'm sure he had his issues in his mind and maybe I assume it would be a struggle to be that talented, but um connecting unlike things. I love how you said that. But it's great it's great, you know, seeing an artist in in any way shape or form just not limit themselves at all. Um just, you know, and that's I mean, that's to me what it sounds like. Um and yeah, I you know, it's 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 really funny because like you know your creativity can be applied pretty much anywhere. I mean that's almost yeah. like always like the uh, it's almost like a job interview in a way. He's like, well, you know, you were you're a music major. Obviously, this is going to be great for you because you you improvise or you know you're able to like a lot of these a lot of the skills that you acquire just in any way, shape, or form with art are easily transferable to almost any other career path that you're working in so you know why would you limit yourself you know what i mean like why can't you be um what i what i personally love is when i see it the other way around when i see someone who comes across as like a very type a person like numbers uh and maybe engineering and science who's like you know we kind of separate them sometimes we think the creative people are disorganized and a little wacky and then the intelligent people are these engineers who are flying the you know the rockets but then you see like this guy floating around outer space like playing uh playing uh playing a uh, david bowie tune and you're like no he understands like he's a creative person like this isn't just he's not he's not he's not completely analog you know he's uh he's he, he has to think creatively and music's just another component of that um so it's just for me it's like one of my favorite components so you pick your you pick your you know you kind of pick your poison in a way but yeah i don't I, think I totally agree you shouldn't you shouldn't limit yourself uh like if you are creative like you know creativity can be as easily applied as just you know how to split up a check you know what i mean there's always very small moments where you can be very creative well so. I, I totally agree and especially if you're looking to support yourself um it, it's important not to limit yourself and and Da Vinci earlier, early, early in his career, when he was looking for a job or a benefactor, someone to sure. sort of float him for X amount of years, he wrote a letter. I forget to whom. You know, one of the one of the rulers of one of the regions, one of the warring regions. They were always warring in Italy, <laughs> uh, all the regions. Um, 
and he wrote basically a cover letter and a resume and he put being a fine painter last he absolutely played that down his earliest stuff was hey i'm really i could invent machines and i would like to invent machines for your military so you can so you know the source uh, family can fuck up the family yeah. and it was very um practical in fact practical in the the military world like i can design these things for you so you guys will be more protected so your prince or whatever they called the the rulers and he put oh yeah and i could paint as well it was an <laughs> afterthought in the cover letter and i was astonished by that well yeah i'm not sure how like and again like unless they were going to paint the you know paint the tanks or something like that I don't even. They probably didn't have tanks. It was probably. I'll, I'll, no I'll, tanks. I'll, I'll paint the. Uh, oh man, I'm gonna have to. The cannons, maybe. Yeah, I'll paint. I'll, I'll give you the most beautiful uh, canvas on a cannon. But <laughs> that kind of and that kind of creative confidence is like always really cool to see in anybody um, when you can just when you just understand that because again these things are generally not um, they're not always tangible. Like, you know, like I think a lot of times, like especially with especially with like careers sometimes um, or just well, I guess pretty much with, with anything you walk into a room and you're kind of expecting to have some directions and where should we go and what should we do and and what should be what should we have when it's done. Um, but when you have the creative confidence to say, like, listen, if you just put me in the room, we're going to figure it out like something's going to happen. And I understand this about myself now because I'm a painter. I'm speaking as like Da Vinci right now. I'm not a painter. Um, but you know, the the fact that like you could walk into a like a like a like a military operation and, and literally be able to say like, listen, I don't know too much about this, but I know I know I can definitely help, and I've definitely done stuff like this before. So. That's yeah. That's that's a really interesting story. I'm gonna have to do a little more research on Da Vinci too. That's a he's a, kind of a newer one to me. I guess I haven't experienced too much of his art in in passing, but um, the seminal uh, biography on him. Oh, I'm blanking on the author's name. He he's written some great ones. Uh, he did one on Einstein. Uh, he did one on Steve Jobs. He's written a few. What's his name? Help me, internet. Internet. Well, I don't know. Why. You're not the internet. Alexa. You're a camera. Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, it, Taylor, if you could, if you could, uh, if you could let me know. Uh, shout out to Taylor. Not through the glass. She's uh, through the wall. She's in the walls. She's in the walls, uh, operating the cameras and the audio, and just just generally calm and on point. Thank you, Taylor. You're it's always doing it always really feels you, you feel safe knowing Taylor's around. She's just like a presence that we know that no matter what we do, we can't we can't mess up too bad. No. <laughs> yeah, well, what does mess up mean? Well, yes, exactly. Um, I um, it's got to be careful with that. Sometimes I talk to my kids, and especially if they're in art class or something, and they say, "Daddy, I made a mistake," and I said, "There's no mistakes in art." And then I realize I got to be careful because like they are getting graded on these things, <laughs> and I'll look at the work. I'm like, well, that. that that there might be a mistake. The mistake of not following the directions at all. Yeah, well, that might be a mistake. Yeah. Well, what do they call that? Um, the uh, the happy accidents, right? Yeah. You, you know. Well, I try and teach them that those. That's things. the Bob Ross mentality. There's no mistakes, just happy accidents. Oh, they just got turned on to him. They're like, "What is this?" Oh man, that that guy was he was so he was so zen, you know, watching him and watching him work, and he's another another artist like. Um, I don't know too much about it, but he had a pretty, pretty industrious life too. Like he comes across like this really serene um, person on on camera, and obviously that was you know what drew people I think to him. No pun intended. And he, uh, but he he was I believe he was in the military as well, and um, had a had a whole a whole nother life like leading up to that the success of that that show. Um, that's interesting but again like just again just com I, I, I've just never been um, I've never been a you know I've never been someone who was who would say like okay just because you play music you should probably just concentrate on music or just because you were an engineer you should just concentrate on your engineering and those are not that those are the paradoxicals there but like they re like I think sometimes we really do associates math and science and then creativity in two different places um but 
Yeah, it's really interesting to see how, you know, how school works that way, too. I mean, I don't, you know, I, your, your, your kids are, you said 9 and 11? 9 and 6. 9 and 6. Yeah. So I remember, like, doing a book report one time, and um, I was Amelia Earhart, right? That was, like, who I did the book report on. And they told us there was, a, like, a class um, where... You, you did the book report, you wrote the whole thing, and then you came in and you gave your speech as Amelia Earhart, right? And I just picked Amelia Earhart because I, I thought it was cool. Like, she's an air, like you should, she flew airplanes, she's kind of a badass, so, like, this is great. And I went home, and I always had trouble with instructions. Always. It was never execution. It was, or I should, that is execution. It was never, never the work. I always spent probably too much time on it, but never read the fine print, basically. And I remember I came home and I was like, mom, I'm Amelia Earhart. I got to dress like Amelia Earhart. I got to do the whole thing. So I like, I got like a bomber jacket. I got a cool little hat. I got like a scarf, like, you know, like to look like a pilot. And I came back into school and I was there the next day and we're, um, we're given the book reports. And I noticed that everybody in the class has a big giant like poster board with a head cut out and they drew their, their character and they're putting their head through the poster board. And now I'm looking at that. I'm going like, well, that's kind of stupid. Like, why would you draw it? You could just dress like the person. Like that made more sense. I knew we, that's what we were supposed to do. We we're supposed to give a report as the person. My teacher comes to me. He's like, Andrew, where's your poster board? And I'm like, what poster board? Like, what are you talking about? You said, we're dressing like the person. You said it in front of the class. We're going to dress. We're going to give the report as the person. Well, yeah, but it said you're supposed to draw a little cardboard cutout put your head through it and give he's like i'm sorry andrew but i have to mark you as incomplete for this i'm dressed like amelia Earhart. i found all the clothes i'm ready have a book report incomplete that's that was a moment where like i definitely felt square peg round hole like i was and i came home and i was like am i wrong and my mom was like you're not wrong that's what you're doing is better don't worry about it. I don't care. And honestly, like I, my, I'm not going to say that's kind of the theme of my life, but it's not not the theme of my life where, you know, places like the DMV are generally very interesting for me because all the things that people just seem to get, like where the line's going <laughs> and uh, who you're supposed to talk to and when you're supposed to talk with them, um, or even just like yesterday, for example, just getting off at the right exit sometimes <laughs> or avoiding tolls. Dude, the DMV, the DMV is tough. I have, I'm it's high rigid. anxiety in the DMV. I thought maybe if I calmed down or I got a different perspective, I, I was stoned one time. Not better. <laughs> Not better. Not no, better. No, no, no. The, the DMV is rigid. And if, it's tough. And everyone there is angry. And honestly, in Sorry my- Sorry if you work at the DMV, but- I've uh, well, not they have, they, met too many not angry people. They, they, I don't even blame them. They have the right to be, and they also have the ability to be, and they also have like it just doesn't matter. Like they can be whatever they want. It's kind they're of up all to them. gods. They're all little gods. They're they're allowed to be. You know what I mean? They're off at five o'clock. They like the, and honestly, it's probably just more of a. It's probably more something that they're dealing with because they have a line of people coming in every single day, and no matter how nice you are, you're just one of a million to them. So I kind of, I, th I try to operate that way, but still like what I do feel, and the reason I bring the DMV into this is because when I say that is what I think that book report was for. I think that instruction to, and me getting an incomplete was training for one day you're going to be standing in line at the DMV and they're going to tell you to stand there. And if you don't understand what instructions are, you're not going to be able to get through a normal day as a human being. And yeah, it was a microcosm. And I'm not saying that I don't, you know, obey any rules or anything like that. But it was definitely one of those moments where like create, create, creative confidence was like tested where you're like, I'm pretty sure this is better. Like I'm pretty sure unequivocally this is more authentic and this is more what she would actually 
sound and seem like in person. I don't think she'd be standing there with a poster board and putting her head through. <laughs> you don't know that. Well, I, you know what? You never met her. Scott, Scott you're, really, you're really pushing the boundaries. <laughs> that, that is absolutely true. She might have loved poster board. I'll have to check. My kids, we have like maybe two like young person's biographies of her. I'm going to have to check and see if there's any chapters dedicated to her uh, poster board art. Yeah. What, what you're, you're describing a, a common critique of education or standard American education as it's come to be, which is basically training for following directions, training for uh, rote memorization. And I'm speaking in generalities here. Um, I've seen, I mean, there's so many amazing teachers. Uh, there's so many amazing classrooms. There's so many amazing schools. But, uh, but there's definitely a strong critique of that rigid formality of doing things, following directions. I struggled as well in school. Uh, I, I struggled hard. Um, I think I just couldn't sit still, uh, I just, I, 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 like all the time. Yeah. And, and I couldn't learn. Um, I did my best. I think I had genes that allowed me, I had the C plus gene. So it's like, no matter what I did or didn't do, I was able to rock a C plus, which was, thank God just got you across the finish line i got across the finish line yep. Yep. and and it's but teaching I, I was probably is more gig. i was probably like that like i was definitely a c plus guy i just feel like i put a lot of extra effort into school that was like where a lot of people didn't work very hard and got very grade got good grades and then there's people who worked very hard and got good grades i worked i felt like i worked like twice as hard as everybody but i got pretty much bees <laughs> a good teacher would a good teacher recognizes uh when you know what would be called different learning styles and, and different ways to express that's maybe more popular now than when i was in school um i'm an old guy but um it's interesting great teachers recognize that and and they learn to work with it but being a classroom teacher is one of the hardest jobs on planet earth i've done it and to have you know 25 30 souls in front of you um, and you have this agenda. Everyone learns differently. Everyone's day has gone differently. Everyone expresses themselves differently. And everyone's, I don't know, whatever's going on silently in their heart during that day. Yeah. It's the toughest gig. I, I Hats off to educators and teachers everywhere. However, broadly speaking, education, I think that's a correct critique to make of education. Um, I what I saw was, you know, you're trying to teach down the middle. And then on this side of the middle is the people who are really struggling for one reason or another. And then on this side of the middle, there's the people who clearly are, are very intelligent, but are just not fitting into the mold. Yeah. And sometimes those two things um, are the same thing. So the child or student you think is just not cutting it, or they might have a learning disability. Well, maybe that maybe they're actually way ahead of things and it's just not fitting into the mold but as a teacher your best bet you play the odds is teaching down the middle and there's probably more support for struggling learners i'd say funding wise and in education and there's been dwindling support of uh, folks who need something different in a creative or gifted i mean that's a that's a silly word in my opinion gifted and talented but everyone's gifted and talented but you know what i mean by that just a different learning style just a different learning style or, or having someone sort of direct their own learning in a way there's dwindling support for that just as there's dwindling support for the arts in general it's usually the first thing to go and i get it i guess if you have to choose like someone who's maybe ahead of things or supporting someone who's really falling behind and is about to fall off the rails i mean if it's my child if i had a decide between my two children i'm going to try and save the one who appears to be drowning sure but it's a it's it's tough where did you um where'd you get your creative confidence from uh it probably started it definitely started in elementary school um so i just had a uh i had a little more i was so it was it was a good place for me to direct a lot of I, i've always been very industrious in general like if you leave me alone long enough like in a room like I'll start doing things, but whether for better or for worse, like I might break everything too. But um, I'm, I'm definitely, if you watch me on a time-lapse, like in my apartment, 
like it's there's there's not a lot of just sitting still it's generally <laughs> like work like you know you you'd see me like zipping around like a lot um when i was in elementary school though there there was a couple we did have a, a music program so the exposure was was very good right on the onset because and they don't give you they didn't give us much just to start um but i do remember like maybe first grade someone like handing me a recorder and just like i'd taken a few pi piano lessons and i was like okay i can i can read this um so it, it definitely started at home but I do remember in school, just to keep it in line with school, I think there was a there was a, um, a like a, a Beethoven song, a really simple one, um, and it was probably like Fair Elise or something like that. And I sat in the back of the room while music class was almost like a free for all. You know, people were just like talking with the teacher, and you know, it broke up halfway through. But I remember sitting in the back of the room, like, all right, I'm just gonna learn this tune. And then at the end of the class, I'm like, all right, everybody. I learned Fair Elise. And they're like, really? Would you like to play it for the class? And I'm like, I would like to play it for the class. And then I play it for the class. And like, then it's like, okay, I can do this. Like, I got everyone's attention. Let's do it. Um, and then, yeah, I think, I think very early on, uh, my mom kind of pushed me, always pushed me, always pushed me to sing, like, everywhere. So it Why? was... Yeah, she just loved hearing the sound of my voice. So she like wanted me to sing everywhere for better or for worse. And I it was not always welcomed. I do remember when I was in elementary school um starting to I was a cantor, right? And like the in the this was a Catholic school, so this was like mass. And I became the cantor very quickly. They were like, "Okay, you know, this boy can hit like a a high D." <laughs> Cuz I'm what, 10? And, uh, you know, it was, that's, they, I, I got to be the cantor, which initially I thought was really cool. But as you get a little older, 10, 11, 12, 13, whatever it is. Um, and like now, you know, I'm joining the basketball team and I'm like, this is really cool. Now I'm on the basketball team. Um, you know, I like this girl, she's at the basketball game. And then, hey, Andrew, would you mind uh, singing the national anthem for us? And I'm like, I mean, I got to do the center tip off. Like, I don't think this is going to psych them out. <laughs> you know, he's like, <laughs> what are we going to, we're going to meet at the middle and the guy's going to go like, Hey, really beautiful rendition uh, right there. You just had, um, and I started to become very self that that's honestly right around that age is where I think I lost a lot of creative confidence because, um, I started drifting into this world where I'm like, I kind of just want to be a jock. Like I kind of, I'm kind of tired of, you know, spending my entire recess just singing with uh, the piano teacher, trying to figure out these church songs. Um, and, you know, I come out and recess is over and uh, my, you know, my dream crush is, uh, I've never even had a chance to talk to her. And, you know, cause you're, that's all I thought about. Like I had, uh, you know, it, I, I was just like any other 13 year old pretty much or 12 year old. I don't know how old you are in eighth grade, but I think I'm talking specifically about eighth grade. And when you're young too, you you don't know, at least I didn't know, I don't know too many people, you don't know that you could blend these things. You don't know that, hey, I can I can split my creative time and my basketball time and they can work together in harmony. You're just not aware. It seems nope. like you have to choose something, especially since kids are generally clicky. Um, well, yeah, yep. And I remember specifically, so, and it, it, it you know, there's a couple moments where like it really didn't it didn't it didn't behoove me like I was like I said my mom saw that clearly like it like because she was she 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 was an adult and she could see that well no it is cool that he can do both he doesn't understand that but he's too young to understand that so don't worry about it that's probably what's going on in her head while trying to be as sensitive to me as she possibly could uh, but I remember that I would always get the the sappiest parts for everything so you know there was a song for the uh christmas play and um there was a donkey and i was the donkey and my mom of course the, the same as the amelia Earhart story like say less like a donkey costume uh i got you so she sewed up this ridiculous onesie with ears and a little hood 
and you know they put a little dot on my nose and I'm wearing the onesie and then I still remember we uh, we were done and she's like well it needs a tail and I'm like it doesn't need a tail mom <laughs> like this is already embarrassing enough and she so what she did was she took uh, she took scissors and she cut a hole in the butt and she tied a little knot and she pulled the tail through the butt and I had a tail right now you just heard how that was just engineered I finished my song um, after the after they they do all the congratulations thank you to all of our players and they're giving us these little chocolate Santas and they're like and our donkey could he come over here and uh, thank you so much Andrew like for singing that beautiful song and I walk across the stage and as I'm walking across the stage everyone starts like kind of laughing and I'm like all right yeah they're laughing because I'm in the donkey costume ha 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 I know it's ridiculous that's embarrassing enough but it's okay I can I can handle that and I go to get my Santa and I turn back around and one of the kids that was sitting on the stage as I was walking by had ripped the tail out and now this big hole and my you know my underwear and everything is like showing it sounds like a nightmare like when I describe it <laughs> and I wasn't uh I wasn't I wasn't too psyched when like he, when I walked by and they just handed me my tail and I'm like, you know, that's really not where creative confidence is built. Um, at like now I look back on it and I'm it's the whole thing is hilarious, but definitely like that was a moment where I think something shifted in my head and I was like, you know what, I'm really tired of singing for everybody all the time. So I'm just going to be a jock. And honestly, like my mom never let me stop singing. So like no matter what the sport, I always sang the, the national anthem before. She would always find a way to get to the guy with the microphone. Like My son's got a really beautiful voice. He should, uh, he should definitely sing the national anthem. If you need somebody to sing the national anthem, he'll sing it for you. Don't even worry about it. And I'd be like sitting there like getting ready for my, my game or my swim meet or whatever the heck it was. And someone, someone would like, it's like, are you ready to sing? Didn't even know I was singing. Thanks, mom. That's great. You had the ultimate cheerleader. My mom, is, she was like almost like my manager. <laughs> uh, but you know, like I said, I, I really there was there was definitely moments where I probably could have, um, I probably could have, I probably could have ha like handled a little less of that, but. Um, it's just really funny too, you know. I was a Division One swimmer, so like I swam all the way through college. Um, I swam through high school, college, like fourteen years in total. Uh, I always had uh, somewhat of a problem because I would sing the national anthem before the meet, and it would get me sort of like nervous and a little verklempt. Like I was like, uh, you know, kind of like, kind of worried, and I was already worried about racing. So like, add uh, you know, singing in front of a bunch of people. Not only that, it's kind of a difficult song to sing. Um, so, and you're in a speedo, let's be honest. And I'm literally in a speedo and I'm soaking wet and like, I'd finish singing and then it's like, all right, cool. Um, you got the 200 fly. Are you ready? Like I, I had a few moments like that, um, which were not super great, but it's really funny that, and I, I just told somebody about this the other day, uh, cause I remembered it, but I finished my last swim race. Um, at my at my school and I was um, working towards this record for like the last like for the, like the four years that I was there it was a like school record and um, I, I ended up breaking the record and I still remember I finished and I broke the record and I looked up and I'm like great I had a gig that night in New York <laughs> so literally I got out of the pool changed and I just hopped on a train and within an hour and a half I was playing at uh, you know the Bowery Electric in uh, New York City and it was funny too because one of the one of my friends whose brother was on our team came to the show and he's like didn't you have a meet today <laughs> you, broke, like, you broke a few records that day it sounds like yeah <laughs> well for most uh, most most things to do in one day probably um, but it, I I I thought about that because, you know, you, you look back on your careers and what you did and what you wanted to do and um, where, like, where, 
you want to be now and like you're you almost wish that you had invested more time into certain things um but at the end of the day it was just funny that music literally was always there like always at the baseline in some way shape or form uh and yeah like i don't necessarily know if like i don't know if the like, creativity was part of my athletic performance really but it wasn't i mean it wasn't not a component of it and um I think, you know, like I said, it was it was definitely something like when you're a kid, you really don't know and you don't understand it. Um, and as you get older, you kind of you see these people doing everything and you're like, no, that makes sense. And that's really cool. You're actually when I look back, I'm like, I might have been a little bit cooler than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to pull all the people who were around at that time and see if that's correct. Yeah, they're like, no, no. That, honestly, the donkey stuff was pretty pretty stupid. Oh, my God. There's, like, endless ass jokes you can make <laughs> just from one story. I had, like, three. Uh, I didn't – I didn't low-hanging fruit. I didn't even go for it. <laughs> you – um, yeah, music has always been there for you. I get that. Me, too. Like, when when you said I, – I told you before we started, I said, you, you don't need to hold the guitar the whole time. And you're like, well, I'm, I'm probably more comfortable holding it. And I said, well, it might be a while. And you're like, That's okay. This I, is, I was able to relate to that. Like, this is fine. When yeah. I'm sitting around the house, like, that's this feels my vibe. better. Yeah, it's like a blanket. <laughs> when we spoke, when we spoke on the phone, um, which was really nice to catch up with you. I mean, you're you're someone who I've admired, but maybe from a bit of a distance because we really, it's not like we hang out and talk, but we we know each other on some level. So having you on the show you know was also a selfish way for me to just connect with you a little bit more and i like to think the show is a platform for other things but ultimately it's a pretty selfish endeavor it's no, people i, I want to get to know better i love talking with you you we it's um first of all one of the first my my first impression of you because i think we met at our mutual friends uh christmas or uh, new year's party and that was just like an introduction but the real time I think I met you was I stumbled in and I saw you playing over at the Yacht Club. And my first impression, like immediately, was, okay, this, this band, this group, and whoever is in charge here, like, knows what they're doing. Because the sound in that room, it almost never sounds good in the Yacht Club. Like, <laughs> it's very difficult to sound good in the Yacht Club. It's, it's not a, an easy room. It's a, it's a strange room. Um, and there's a lot of metal so it's very loud and not saying bands sound terrible there, but it's not an easy room to sound good in. And that's obviously part of the charm of the whole place. But when I walked in, I was like, it sounds very good and it doesn't normally sound this good. And that's when I really paid attention. Like I was like, yeah, you guys were playing as a three piece. And like, again, like, I, I didn't know I didn't know any of the music I didn't know any of the songs or anything like that but I'm like everything about this is very very professional and good and I was like you can kind of tell a lot by what someone does in those specific situations um, you can tell a lot by somebody by just I mean honestly when I'm talking to musicians you can learn a lot about someone by just talking with them, but you can learn even more just like jamming with them for just a little while. Um, yeah. You know, if you start playing with someone and you're in something, I'm going to keep it general, but if something just feels off, uh, generally speaking, you probably won't get along with them too well as a person, you know, uh, and, and different strokes to different folks. But I really believe that um, that's why the better the musicians get, the better the conversations generally get too. I've never had issues walking into a room full of musicians. Everybody seems to be able to just counterbalance each other's energy because that's essentially what you're doing when you play music with people. You're, you're finding the holes and filling them when they need to be filled. And if they don't need to be filled or they're not supposed to be, and that's what's beautiful about it, and you're aware of that, I mean, you know, there's a I, I, there's a list that's circulated around, but it's like the rules of playing music, um, and it's <laughs> it's it's pretty accurate. Uh, a lot of it's just if you play music a lot and you play with a lot of different people, it seems obvious. But one of the 
one of the if one of the rules was if you don't hear it don't play it and i was like yeah like that makes perfect sense um and if you don't know what you're doing i don't know if this is one of the rules <laughs> if you don't know what you're doing don't play that's a very simple thing to do i think one of the most powerful things that some musicians can do while they're jamming with someone is to just put down their instrument and just listen because you're going to learn a lot more and you're you're I don't know, let's say it's a guitar player or something. Your noodling is not going to help this situation at all. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, I think I touched a nerve on that one. <laughs> Noodlers. Nudes. I have, uh, I have a low tolerance for noodlers. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, there's there's definitely, you know, there's definitely a moment where um, learning a song and noodling are not the same thing anymore. Um and some of the best musicians I've ever played with, I think, uh, they don't really, they don't touch their instrument until it's time to play. Um, one of the guys who who actually played on the, the single that's coming out, Window, uh, this guy, Mike Nordsey, um, one of the things that I noticed about him, like right off the bat was, you know, he just, we would talk about the song, we'd talk about the key, we'd talk about the movement, we'd talk about, you know, kind of like where we thought it should go. And aside from, you know, tuning up, <laughs> as soon as it was time to go, it was like right at the starting block and the guy just, and uh, like he doesn't, he, does, he didn't need to do anything. There was a moment, and this is professionalism at its best, but there was a moment too where I look at him and I'm like, I don't think it really, like, I think I could sing this better in another key. And he's like, okay, what key? And he, he's, I'm like, let's just move it to E flat. And he's like, okay. And I'm like, he's like, you ready? I'm like, oh, you don't even need to like get a feeling for that whole thing. <laughs> I know that's what professional musicians do, but didn't touch it. Just completely moved the entire song. Not an easy song either. Moved it and like the, you know, like I said, it says a lot about the person, you know, and Mike, uh, Mike Norenzi is definitely one of those guys. Like when you're talking with him, there's a lot you're looking at him but there's a lot going on i love mike he's, he's mike's a friend i've done recordings with mike um he is a badass musically he's he's a he's a he's got a, a badass mind too but uh he um he had played some upright on on a record that it i really love this record is uh tony tedesco and full fathom five yeah i was uh drumming on that album quotes i want to hear that quote. record too I'll, I'll send it to you yeah that's that's like you on drums i want to hear that yeah it's really understated i think i just brought a, a floor tom and a snare drum and like and like a shaker i think that was my move that's oh no a, there might have been a some kind of symbol in there but um if in, you showed up to a session with me with just that i'd be like i don't know who this guy is but i like him i ended up getting i ended up getting gigs and calls from people hearing that record and be like, what's going on there? And they're like, oh, uh, you know, this guy, he, it, dude, it was born of laziness. I'm like, I'm not going to fucking bring a kick drum. So if you listen to Nordsey's playing on this album, Nordsey's the kick drum. So he knew his place. I knew my place. We, we tracked it live. It's not a slick, it's not slick in any way. I'll share it with you. And for anyone who's listening, uh, Tony Tedesco and Full Fathom 5, we did two records, but um, I don't think the second one was ever released. So there's one out there. And if you want to hear some cool bass playing, um, and you might think that that's drumming, it's not. I brought two or three things. It was might even been one more than I should have brought. <laughs> and I was playing it. Like the I, outfit. Take one thing off. <laughs> I took a lot off. I was basically singing the national anthem in a speedo. I had, <laughs> I had a lot off. And, uh, and it was great. I ended up getting calls. Uh, to drum and then I'm like this is great you know I love being a drummer <laughs> it's the best it's lighter than a guitar um, it's also you don't have to learn keys or anything like that which is kind of nice guitar is a little can be so, somewhat labor intensive well that's when you just don't play That that's that's the stop playing yeah like it, a bassist there's too much pressure on bass bass is everything like bass you have to do it's your not only percussion and Different. harmony you're, you're the catcher you're the you're catcher, the catcher. On the, on you're the in every play field absolutely yeah, and drumming i mean the pressure comes from being able to to play in time i'm like a uh, i'm like a third string drummer 
Yeah, but that's like that's still decent. That's very decent. You're like D two, <laughs> yeah. D two, a D two drummer. Yeah. I mean, honestly, that that to me, we, we were um. There, there's a young guy I play with, uh, David. Um, uh, I'm forgetting his last name right now, to be honest. But um, we uh we play together, and he's a really young guy. He's 19 years old. Um, and just one of those one of those drummers when um when he when he's not sure what's going on. He really pays attention and he listens to the song and you sometimes sometimes it's as simple as just, you know, maybe you keep the groove going when everything's falling apart, but also just listening and being nice to the song. I'm a big believer in just, you know, be kind to the song because the song is really at the end of the day what everyone's trying to complete. Um and whatever that means, it could mean putting down the drumsticks like halfway through and just letting this, letting this happen. Um, the hard, it's, it's, it's a lot easier to throw paint at a canvas than it is to just take a step back and say like, this might be done. You know, this might be, this might be the, the finished thing. Yeah. Well, once you get your ego out of the way, you don't feel the need to add color. Some of the things like, you know, it's funny cause you know, as a musician, you're kind of a, uh, you kind of have to, as a professional musician, I would say, you kind of have to be a little bit of everything these days. Um, and I would also say, like, you kind of get to be a little bit of everything, too. It's kind of, a, in a way, somewhat of a privilege. Uh, some, sometimes it's just a little too much work. But um, one time, the, like, recently I was putting together, you know, some, uh, some, some merchandise, and I was, like, trying to find, like, the perfect logo or something, right? And I was trying to... It's like I gotta draw something. I gotta, I gotta have something that's gonna really say who I am and what I'm about, and get the whole image across. And I want it to complement the music in a very specific way. And uh, it was my girlfriend who like just took a picture of me and just traced it. And I was like, there you go. That's it. That's simple. And it's just a, it's just a, it's a picture of me that she traced. And then I just wrote my name in pen and we copied that. And you look at it and you're like. Well, that was simple enough. That's actually who I am, and that's actually my handwriting. So, I mean, it doesn't really get much more authentic than that. <laughs> that's nice, and if, and especially when you could express things simply, um, particularly in the in the the arts, like the visual arts, mm -hmm. when you could express things simply, I love that. Some, a lot of my favorite art. I mean, I know we mentioned some very detailed, detail-heavy artists earlier, but some of my favorite artists just, it's very, it's very simple. It's very understated. That's the, lately, those are the things that grab me. Um, well, with so much out there and with everyone beating your, beating your, you know, beating you over the head with, um, you know, content, it, uh, to be honest, it's sometimes, you know, it's like, it's like being at a party and everyone's just yapping away and you're like, all right, well, this guy's just sitting in the corner. He looks like he's enjoying himself. He's not really talking to anybody. What's his deal? You know, um, I think that uh, there's a lot to be said for just stay in your lane and try and be as authentic to yourself as you possibly can. Um, and really, like, just don't overthink it. You know, it's like it's really it's just so it's so easy. It's not a struggle to overthink think something it's actually easier to overthink things i think it comes with experience and that i mean I keep going back to this phrase that you you mentioned creative confidence and when we spoke on the phone you were very quick to express like yes play a song and i'm like yeah we we had a uh, renee maskin from yeah. low light oh, she had her. played I a song her. i had asked her to play a song though um you brought it up I guess I just lost touch with that. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, that's something we can do. Of course. And um, and you're like, yeah, you know, we'll we'll play. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm not playing the song. You're playing the song. You're like, no, nah, no, nah, you're gonna play the song. Yeah. Like, I probably shouldn't play the song. You're like, it would be good if you played the song. And I was like, you're you're crazy. You're like, you're you're right. And you you you're very persuasive. Well, so I said yes, and. And I was uh, thinking, oh, well, that's crazy. I mean, I'm trying to, I'm trying to host this show. And then you sent me, you sent me the tune, uh, the song called "Window," which you mentioned. Uh, which is Mike crazy Norsey. too, because we're like talking through the glass, which is essentially a window. It's so fucking appropriate <laughs> on so many levels. And um, 
and, you know, and we brought up Mike Nordsey. He played the, the players on it are great. It, it's a beautiful song. And I probably still might have pushed back um, a few more times just because. But you were super persuasive. And then I heard the song and I'm like, oh, it's a fucking great song. I'm not going to let him play that by himself i need to get a little i need to put a little, a little olive oil on that <laughs> and well and to be honest it's a very simple song and not like you know the only thing that really is well not the only thing but one of the things that i particularly love um is creating and writing like very simple songs because you know two chords like i've always i actually i i, I kind of have this belief like if a song's good enough to play live in general, and you know that, um, start counting chords because the less chords, the better the song, I think. So, you know, in some ways, like chords can be much more complimentary to um, certain certain songs. But for me personally, I like um, one of my favorite songs ever is Harry Nilsson Coconut. Uh, the song is one chord on that just vamps, um, and just the fact that you know, you're able to be creative enough with that limitation saying like, we're only going to, we're, we're going to have one chord for a very long time. This better be entertaining. <laughs> because well, it forces, it, it puts all the pressure on the songwriter, the storyteller. And um, it doesn't hurt that you have a killer voice. You want to, uh, you want to do that tune? I, I'd love to play that tune. So uh, folks, we've never really done this before. So I might need a D from you though. Sounds like uh, I'm so, in. Sounds okay. Funny enough, I, I, I mentioned this to you earlier, but I think it's worth mentioning. Um, last night, we, uh, we had a gig at the Asbury Park Lanes last night, and I got back pretty late, and I was very hungry. So I made, um, I made myself an egg sandwich, and um, all the trimmings, avocado, I put some chives on it, had like toasted it up a little bit. Somewhere in the middle of all that, I sliced my middle finger. Uh. And um, honestly, I didn't even mind. Like I, I literally just handled it and just wrapped it up. And I woke, and when I woke up this morning, I'm like, oh yeah, that happened. Wait a minute, I gotta play a song today. How's this gonna work? So Let's hear how it works. Fortunately, the song's two chords, so uh, we can get away with it. Yeah, I'll be 
your work could be Anywhere you're going Anywhere you're going I'm with you Anywhere you're going Anywhere you're going I'm with you Anywhere you're going Anywhere you're going Good song. Oh, that was great. That's Thank you so much for playing that with me. You sing it so beautifully too. That was that was voice. I'm gonna well, say it. I'm gonna say wonderful. It right Thank you. I appreciate that. You play beautifully, uh, and that was also the first time we've ever played that song together ever. So that's cool too. First time we ever played together. That's the first time we've ever played together. <laughs> just period. That was it. <laughs> it's just, it just happened. That's really exciting. Yeah, we should we should definitely uh, we should definitely play together more. This is um, and uh, like. Honestly, like I said, so uh, me not, I, I honestly mean it when I say that when you, cause you said that you were, you know, had some opposition about, you know, joining me, my, my confidence as far as what you would bring to the, to the, to playing on that song was completely verified by just walking into the yacht club that day. I was like, Oh, okay. I, I, I know, I know this guy isn't an a-hole <laughs> that's the best that's how i would think about that, it that's really all it is so um in a world of so many yeah i was like i just the, just the way he plays all right he's not a butthead you know <laughs> that's that's all um oh man so, so super cool yeah thanks for um thank you for putting a little um a little uh, emphasis on, on me doing that with you I, I'm, I'm thankful for that so, oh it's no. a really beautiful song so are you the song's called Window, everybody. Yes. Uh, what Are you releasing that? Yeah, so that'll be What's coming out on April 1st. I have that song as well as um, uh, a second a second tune um, that are coming out together. So it's a kind of like a split EP or like two-song EP. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's a lot of lot of love on the, you know, I've, I've been working on this, um, this batch of tunes for the better part of um, – uh, most of this since like you know since this since pandemic um so it's been very interesting like working that way remotely um sending things to a lot of people um and also you know just having a lot more time and space to flesh things out and hear maybe where i want them to go um i was really fortunate enough to work with uh one of our mutual friends uh david spellman um who helped really like get the ball rolling on a lot of just the creative energy um just really pushing like you know being a being a bit of like pushing me into some situations that i wasn't sure of, like well i've never played with mike norty before i don't know anything about this guy um but definitely you know it takes a real friend and it takes someone who really understands you to um to to know what you would like before you've ever heard of it uh, so, you know, you know generally what you like, and you know generally what you're comfortable with. But it takes a really someone who really understands you will bring you that one little trinket. You're like, I just know what you're about, so you'd probably enjoy this. David's uh, good like that. He's really good. Like he's that's got a, one of his natural talents. I think is being a catalyst for um, things coming together. Yep. Um, uh, he brings a lot of people together. Uh, no and doubt. I've, I've definitely. I, I would say that's you know, um, aside from being just. Uh, you know, def definitely having like you know an artist soul. Um, he's a that's one of his biggest strengths is like bringing people together. Which I mean, for for you know, like we've said before, I mean that's inherently what creativity sort of is. It's just connecting, you know, maybe two unlike individuals who have never worked together. 
Um, another great uh, person I got to you know work with on these two songs specifically um, was Jack Daly. Yeah. Jack Daly mixed the record um, over at his place. Um, so dug deep. God, he was he, you know, Jack Daly is another one. I, I, like we've we've talked about all this stuff, um, but you know he he played bass on uh, the second song. Um, there's a second song on this EP that's called It's You. And he played bass on it and we were listening. I was like, sounds really good. I'm like the mix sounds really nice. I'm like, and he's like, do you have any feedback? I'm like, I mean, you could turn the bass up. <laughs> that was you. Like, he's like, <laughs> I thought maybe. And I was like, just the fact that I need to tell you to turn your own track up it says a lot and you know that's that's the reason why uh jack daly is you know an, a consummate professional in my opinion he he really is he cares about the music he cares about the song um and he wants you know he's he he wants the best result for that you know and which is inherently like you know i feel like when you're making a record like this everyone is just slowly helping push this big boulder up a hill um you know and uh, I think, you know, that's that's the beauty of getting a chance to work with so many different musicians. Um, Kevin Bright played on Window as well. Um, he's a great guitarist from the uh, Nora Jones, um, uh, probably most famously like playing on like the, those Nora Jones earlier uh, records. And you can hear it, um, you know, just another guy like I asked him to play a solo and it's like one note and I'm like, well, of course, that's why you're a professional. That's why this is why we I wanted to work with you because, you know, again, just being really kind to the song. Um, and then another drummer uh, who just at this point, I, I just so admire because we became friends as well. Um, but uh, Donald Edwards um, out in uh, New York City, who um, again, like showed up and, you know, one of the things that's interesting that we didn't, we, Norji and I, we tracked this in a room together and that's where it started. Um, and then we started layering pieces on from there. Now I did work directly with Donald Edwards, the drummer, but there was no click track. So he was just listening, like listening to a, you know, a recording that was already there. The drumming is sweet. It reminded me of like some of the stuff that Brian Blade does. It's like, I, I never know how to describe drumming that i really like so i'm not gonna try no but the drumming is sweet that's i mean that's a great way to describe it just really sweet and uh you know it's really funny because there's all these little th little things maybe maybe you find them because you're looking for them or maybe you find them because you know the proximity principle or whatever but your um donald edwards walked in and i was like you know what's really funny is like your name is both of my grandparents my grandpa's first name so I have a grandpa named Donald, and that's my middle name, Donald, and I have another grandpa named Edward, <laughs> right? Donald Edwards. And I'm like, well, that's really funny. And also, side note, Edward and Andrew have the same letters. Snap. Just mix them up, and you got the same name, but Edward and Andrew are the same. They have the same letters in them. <laughs> I wish Donald and Andrew had the same letters in them, because that would like complete this trinity in some way that... I wouldn't even understand. We have to create like a, a unique name that that is able to. We'll get we'll get to it later when we have that'll a pen be, and paper. Yeah, that'll be yeah. That'll be my that that'll be my son's name. It'll be like a Reskunam <laughs> with a D somewhere. I didn't. I don't think I got a D in there, but there's got to be. That'll be well. It's a silent D. It's a, it's a silent. That's it's there one there might of those be a silent few D's. silent letters in that name. Yeah, <laughs> and then the, like the, the, the W, are... the R are silent. Your name is uh, your name is Ra. <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually 12 letters and it's one syllable. Thank yeah. you. He's yeah. very unique. We're yeah. very unique people. Did yeah. I mention we're unique? Yeah. Well, you mentioned bringing unlikely things together and that's totally true. Dude, you got you brought fucking tennis rackets. I did. Yeah. Why why did you bring show us your tennis? Well, racket. let's talk about I will tennis. put down the uh, so, you know, there's a <laughs> He brought tennis rackets. Yeah, I brought tennis rackets. Um I wanted to give you one, you know, just like to have in the studio. These are, you know, I keep these in my apartment. Um, they're great thinking tools, you know, like when you just, when you're kind of like a little stumped for an idea, you kind of can just like work on like a forehand. And so one of the things too, 
Um, now these are very old tennis rackets. What year would you say those rackets are? Well, we're looking at, this is a Bjorn Borg um, signature racket. Now this is more like, you know, I, I would guess this is something like a, like the Roger Federer Nike racket that maybe you'd get at like, you know, like the, um, like Dick Sporting Goods or something like that. A reasonably, you know, kind of like a player's racket, but definitely more of like, you know, attractive because Bjorn Borg was a Wimbledon champion several times over. Now this is set, this is tennis in like the 70s, so a totally different world. But Bjorn Borg was maybe, maybe, maybe he's less known, maybe he's more known, but um, most people are familiar with John McEnroe. And Bjorn Borg uh, famously had one of the longest matches, if not the longest match in history, against John McEnroe and at Wimbledon, at a Wimbledon final. And it was really interesting because Bjorn Borg was like a perfect athlete and John McEnroe was not. And watching like the David and Goliath situation go on um, is really interesting. Now, you might call me a front runner because I like Bjorn Borg and because I couldn't help myself and I bought a Bjorn Borg racket on eBay. Um, but I really gravitate towards I really gravitated towards him and I gravitated towards just the I don't know it had like a Roman Coliseum sort of vibe to the to it that entire match in general so um, but you know what I will say is that when this um, when you know when March came around and like there was a lot less gigs um, one of the first things I did um, was I went and went to the, the park and just started hitting a tennis ball with a friend of mine and I uh, like immediately just discovered something that I'd never tr really tried before and wound up be like getting so invested and ingrained in playing tennis that it actually became a bit obsessive. So that's why I've got like a lot of tennis rackets with me. I also wanted to share this with you because you had told me that you had played a little tennis as well. I love tennis and I don't think my camera might have died so... It's Am not I, the worst thing I, in the world that everyone's just looking at you. You're a handsome guy. I'm well, throw that out there. I right appreciate now. that. I've been working on the beard. Um, Looks good. Thank you. Uh, but yeah, so my uh, my it was just a, it was a new. I don't know when it came to tennis though. Like it was just something that first of all it was a great activity because it was outdoors. You're kind of able to you know do like a socially distant thing if necessary, and. It just get, it kind of just gave me something to work on for the period of um, you know time where I had a little more a little extra time on my hands. I used to play I used to play tons of tennis. I was never that good. What I liked about it was it was um, it felt solitary. It's definitely a solo. It's definitely a head sport. Like you have to you have to figure out you know what's going on. Um, with your opponent, you have to figure out what's, uh, you know, you're looking for weaknesses, I think. <laughs> I'm going to say I think after everything I say, that sounds like I know what I'm doing with tennis. Because at the end of the day, I've been playing tennis for about a year. I just Oh, is that it? Really? Because I saw, like, I saw an, uh, an Instagram story of you. Um, clearly, you were showcasing your tennis ability with maybe a coach or a friend. And you did not look like a player who had been playing for a year so. How, yeah, how, how did well, that could, come naturally? It's, it's a difficult sport. I mean, I was never good. I worked on my game a lot um, just to get to decent. And then I entered a few tournaments, and then I realized I'm not good. <laughs> I was like the guy that they're like, oh, good, I'm up against him in the first round. And I just got shit on two years in a row, the Asbury Park Tennis Invitational. Oh, my God. There was an Asbury Park Tennis Invitational? Like That's you, what it was called. That yeah. is the coolest thing I've ever heard of. I was maybe somewhere between 13 and 15. I feel Should like we it's... start an Asbury Park tennis club? I've been thinking about this. Well, I think it's a great sport. Um, I think I mean, we should. I think, I think any idea is it. worth exploring. <laughs> uh, we played. We didn't. The games weren't in Asbury Park, though. The games were at the fields, the courts. See, I said fields. That's yeah, yeah, you know yeah. I'm not a good player. I say pools. <laughs> <laughs> at um at Neptune High School. Oh yeah, yeah. So, I play there. I that's one of the one of my uh one of my haunts at this point. That's where I would go. I would go by myself, 
and just this is how geeky I was and how comfortable I was being alone. I would bring my boom box. Oh. And I would just crank something I was into at the time and I would just serve yeah. for two hours. Just practice to serve. By myself. Yep. Just it's, at the Neptune chords. I'm, I'm a Neptune guy, so I felt very comfortable just it's, being it's in It's meditative. Neptune. It's, you know, the whole process of, um, you know, meditation to me is pretty much any activity where your this organization is happening around you and you try to just focus on one thing so that, that dis- disorganization doesn't become like a negative force against you. Because at the end of the day, disorganization is fine as long as you are at the end of the day focused on what you need to do next. A recent guest, Michael Mills, talked about that from the KYDS organization. And yeah. I know you got to get going soon, but I brought you something. Oh, what? Uh, stretch here. Look at this thing. I um I like going at yard sales. You weren't joking. You brought a tennis racket. Dude, of course I wasn't This joking. is the longest conversation we've ever had. I like you so much. <laughs> I like you so much. I found this at a yard sale and I just said, oh, well, I got to pick it up. I liked the color of the- The color um, is beautiful. And it's got this- recreation parks tag 1979 what and it's a uh it's a jack kramer autograph model jack kramer so i want to give this to you you're i was gi- you're, when I bu- you're when giving I got, that to me yeah, Why don't, do you want to trade no yeah. i will take your tennis racket thank I you i was gonna frame this that's <laughs> but i didn't have a um like it was either like the frame was too small like i was gonna use one of those you know like lp um yeah frames. This was too big for that. And then other things I had were too big. I'm way too stupid to be like, oh, let me just measure it and get a frame. That's not going to happen. <laughs> so I got to just find it. Well, how cool street. is that? So this is for you. It's, it's amazing. They just hell. give these things away now sometimes too. Like I got my- Well, my... it's not playable. If you could see that, folks. Oh, it's a little, little, There's a, little uh, twisted. It's got a curve, but it's, it's cool. And I, I just- So I want to give this to you. I'm sorry. Like I've been basing a lot of uh, my aesthetics, uh, you know- lately and it's not you know it's not gra- it's it's really a gravitational thing um because i've been playing so much tennis one of the colors that just seem to get associated with tennis in general is green um like wherever you seem to go there's like a green court a blue court but you know green seems to be something that just seems to happen a lot especially with wimbledon you see white and green it's like a very they're very stark contrast there and it's why it's such a beautiful event in well, they one play way. on grass too. It's, it's a, it's an, it's really, really something. And grass is a totally different. I've never played on grass, but not neither have I. I played on clay once. You ever play on clay? I've played on clay. It's wacky, uh, right? Yeah, yeah. And I so the whole thing. So, um, you know, my my family all played tennis. I never touched it because I was so busy with swimming. And the last year, I really just discovered something in it um, that was like. It was it was as simple as that. I played with my mom one afternoon. She, you know, is a very talented tennis player. But, you know, we like practiced a couple of serves and like my serve was horrendous, like, like really, really bad. But like a great cheerleader, she was like, that was fantastic and hooked. Now I have to learn how to do it just like Beyond Borg or. Well, you've probably got a nasty serve. I mean, I, you're a tall guy. You've got gigantic swimmer's shoulders. I, I, I don't want to be on the other end. <laughs> However, I would like to say this spring. Would you like to play some tennis? I would love to play some tennis. And we could, we should try these because I've never played with them before. Yeah, yeah, of course. I might give them a, I might give them a spin. Uh, I mean, why not? We, we should bring some real rackets, but uh, this might be kind of, it's a, it's a whole different game with like the, with the, with the older rackets. It's a gentleman's game. It's point. definitely, it's <laughs> definitely, it's definitely a gentleman's game. Uh, yeah, so let's play some tennis this spring. That sounds fantastic. And, um, and let's not have this be the last time that we play music together. I really appreciate you asking me to play that song, Window. Where will that be released on? How can people find Brother Andrew's yeah. music to be released? So if um, you can follow me on any social media, um, you know, Instagram is usually my best bet. Um, but uh, who is Brother Andrew is a great way to find me as well. Um, who is Brother You can actually. You can actually pre-save the single there. Uh, so, yeah, if you're looking for the music, um, you know, Who is Brother Andrew or Brother Andrew Music generally gets you there uh, before, you know, you start finding a bunch of, you know, religious retreats or that sort of thing. But uh, I, uh, yeah, so the, the song will be available um, everywhere. Um, we, you know, we shot some video um, at the lanes last night. Um, we're going to kind of 
compile that into a bit of a, a music video for that release as well. Oh, cool. So um, we have a lot of clips like to like that over, from just playing live together and, you know, some like over the last couple of months. So we're going to we're going to put that all together again. Like, you know, it, it's really fun releasing music. Um, it's it, it's a it's an endless project. And, uh, it, you know, there's just been so many great people involved and uh, who have really helped out um, kind of countless to name. But, uh, you know, I'm really excited to put some music out. It's been like been about a year, I think, since I've put any music out into the into the world. And I've got a lot more where that's coming from. Uh, so, yeah, please, if you want to, uh, you know, stay on top of the release, you can pre save it and on my website and you can um yeah you can always follow me uh on pretty much any social media platform all right so you sh y'all should check out brother andrew's music you can you could simply search who is brother andrew <clears throat> you heard the song window here on the show tonight um oh real quick uh so on your instagram I don't even know if you remember doing this. You probably do. You're a kind of chance. I, I have a pretty good memory. But like a year or maybe more ago, you had done a story, an Instagram story that I just happened to click on. And it was so hysterical that my kids still, it's got to be about a year, still will sing. Do you remember what you did? You, you sang in an operatic voice. Soup in a shoe. Soup in a shoe. Soup in a shoe. My kids still think about soup in a shoe oh man and they uh, only heard it a couple times that day it's not like i've gone back to it i mean it's a story so it's probably gone but you doing this uh, soup, in soup in a shoe they love soup in a shoe well, so you're hitting all the demographics dude i i'll tell you what i love just i love hearing that that makes me really really happy um i love entertaining people like it just it's just in my nature and whatever that means 99% of the time, um, those things are just things that are happening throughout the day. And you yeah. could ask all the people that are generally around me. I'm usually just making up things and singing random things throughout the day. And well, that's like when social media is at its best. I mean, you can be calculated and super cool, but there's enough calculated super cool out there. There's not a lot of soup in a shoe. <laughs> and well, it's inherently, I mean, in a lot of ways, I, when I did it, uh, you know, I was sitting there with my mom and I was actually, you know, I'd stopped by my, my mom's house and she had given me, she, she was so, she was so excited with my, like I was playing tennis. So she actually like, uh, she had, she's a tennis pro and she was like, I'll get you a pair of tennis shoes. And I was like, so I ca came by the house and she had this beautiful pair of tennis shoes waiting for me. And I'm like, you're, you're, you're amazing. Thank you. And she's like, before you go, I have some soup if you want it. Like, you know, that'd be great. And I took it. I'm like, oh, it's great. I'll just put it in the shoe. And then I just started, for some reason, the the the, the, the two words just sounded so nice together to sing. And I started singing around the house. And it was cracking my mom up. She was just, like, on the floor, like, laughing. And I'm like, all right, well, this is, I think this is pretty funny. Let me share it with somebody else as well. Well, my <laughs> kids dug it right away. They still think about it. Um, and it's just the that age-old uh formula of putting two unlikely things together in a creative way i think <laughs> well, you do a hell of a well, lot yeah, of that soup in a shoe has never really been done before um if know, there weren't new shoes i was i was considering just dumping the soup and just seeing how that went as well <laughs> <laughs> shout out to your mom who clearly has had such an impact on you so shout out to all moms out there that's a tough gig you create a baby inside you you get it out of you and you try not to kill it for the most part you're yeah. trying to keep it alive and and, and more it's an amazing thing. I'm always astonished by the work my mother did in my life and that my wife does in our kids' lives. Shout out to moms everywhere. Brother Andrew, thanks for coming on the show, man. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for playing that song with me. And uh, yeah, this was, a, this was a treat. Honestly, if you ever want to do this again, I'm 100% down. I'm so. down with that too. I'll see you on the tennis court. Sounds great. Yep. That's our show. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye.